methods for equitable change. I'm going to talk about a lot of statistics. There are a ton of slides at the end of this deck with all of the resources. Um, if you want to recreate the statistics, I have about 40 minutes of your time today, and I am aware of what an investment that is, both for you individually and for our community uh, as a whole. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity to talk to you. And I myself and a lot of people that I work with put a lot of time into this content, so I hope that it is, it is productive for you. So let's do this. But first, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Megan Albertson. I'm a Jackson kid. I grew up here. I graduated from Lumen Christi. After that, I went over to the good guys in Ann Arbor. <laughs> Love it. So good. Can't wait for Saturday. And I got two degrees, a science degree in mathematics and a master of public health degree. After grad school, I met and married a girl from Cleveland, Ohio, and now I am a Browns fan, which was actually really fun until the season started, and now it's been kind of rough. But Together, she and I maintain a small herd of three fur babies, two of which love us back. Um, <laughs> right, uh, you know, cat joke. Um, I have been working at Henry Ford Allegiance Health since 2011, always in the Department of Population Health and the Population Impact Project Manager. So now you know. And it is true that I am an employee of Henry Ford Allegiance Health, but that's actually not why I'm talking to you today. I'm talking to you today because of the responses we received from the infographics, which were produced by the Jackson Collaborative Network. And the Jackson Collaborative Network is a group of a bunch of folks representing a bunch of different organizations that volunteer to work together to redesign systems of care in our community so that our population level outcomes improve. And we do that by collaborating to design organized and aligned strategies to make the services that we provide more accessible and effective for the people who need them. And that's true, that's what we do, but that's not the full story of who we are. Above all things, Jackson Collaborative Network is a set of values. We have three core values, they're listed here. Equity, authentic engagement, and continuous learning. And regardless of what strategy we're working on, the values keep us grounded in the true work, the lasting work that we want to see in our community, which is creating equity and continually, le continually learning to know each other in a deeper and more authentic way. And the values make sure that the work we're doing isn't just something that happens out there in the community, to the community, but it's also something that happens in here, in our own hearts, in our own minds, and in our own relationships. And so Jackson Collaborative Network is about entity, about equity. And understanding that is essential to understanding both why the infographics look the way they do and the content that I'm going to present today. We work to increase equity. And to increase equity, we need to be able to measure equity. And disparities data is one of the most powerful ways we have to do that. So when we see disparities, these big gaps in outcomes between populations, we can identify instances of inequity. And when we do that, we can identify ways to address that inequity. And so disparities data is a really important part of what we do, and it's why the information you see here and pretty much everything we do in the Jackson Collaborative Network looks the way it does. So disparities data is important. So we're going to talk a little bit, just clarify exactly what we mean by disparities. So disparities are differences between groups that are too big to be due to chance. So if, for example, I were to take the average height of everybody on this side of the room and compare it to the average height of everybody on this side of the room, we would expect those two numbers to be more or less the same. Not exactly the same to the inch, right? But more or less the same. You're kind of just randomly sitting here. Now, that's different than if we were to, say, take the average height of all of the men in this room and compare it to the average height of all of the women in this room. In that instance, we would expect those two averages to be more pronounced, the difference, right? Because that's not a random assortment. There's actually something going on that's affecting the results in those two groups. In this very simple instance, on average, height is a function of sex. So we would expect to see something different. And there are disparities all around us. Often we assume that disparities are just the way the world is. So sexual assault. Over a lifetime, an estimated 19% of women will experience rape. That number among men is 2%. 19% among women, 2% among men. That difference is too great to be the result of chance. Right? That is not random. There is something going on there. There is something about being a woman in the United States that dramatically affects the likelihood that you will experience rape. 
Youth homelessness is another classic example. Queer youth are over twice as likely to experience homelessness as their straight and cisgender peers. That difference is too great. That is not random, it is not due to chance. There is something about being queer in the United States that dramatically increases the likelihood that you will experience homelessness as a youth. Mass incarceration is arguably the most destructive instance of disparities in contemporary society, and there is way too much here to call out any one thing, but for folks who are interested, the book The New Jim Crow is an exhaustive analysis of how mass incarceration predates black and brown men. And that leads us to race because black and brown folks experience worse population level outcomes in virtually every metric we track. So today, we are going to be talking about race. And I wanna go into why that is, because I could have chosen any kind of disparity, there are tons of them, but we're gonna talk specifically about race today, and we're gonna do that for two reasons. One, we're gonna talk about race because that's where we need it, that's where we're needed. The experience of being black or brown in this town is where people are suffering, our people, our friends, our family, our neighbors, the people that we were commissioned to support and care for. And yet, all of these statistics are just numbers on a graph, but each one of them represents a human being, a real, live, living, breathing, loving, feeling person in this town of infinite value and worth. And when we break down the experience of life in Jackson by race, we are exposed to some of the highest concentrations of suffering in our community, and that's where we belong. Reason number two, we're gonna talk about race because talking about race is hard. It feels socially and politically contentious. Otherwise boring statistics feel dangerous and risky when we use them to name the tremendous power of pigment on health and well-being. And just so we're clear, no other group in the history of our nation has experienced such prolonged, deliberate, systematic, structural, and documented barriers to health and well-being as black and brown folks. And yet, naming that truth is disruptive to business as usual. And that disruption is where I belong. And it's where my friends and colleagues in the Jackson Collaborative Network belong. Our content is provocative by design. We are talking about race, not despite, but because of the emotional response it evokes. And when we present our content, we do hear a lot of emotional responses. One of the most common responses we hear goes something like this. I treat every client, patient, person the same, regardless of what they look like, regardless of race. Right? It's essentially a response of intent intention, right? I treat everyone the same. It is my intention that everyone receives the same excellent care. It's a really common response. I think it's a really intuitive response because we tend to think that our intentions are a direct reflection of our character, right? So to posit that your intentions are somehow not good or not right or not noble can be deeply upsetting, painful even. So let's get this out. I do not believe that the, the disparities data in Jackson look the way they do because it is any of our intentions. The intentions of you, of our healthcare system, of anyone in our community. Quite the opposite. I believe that if any one of you were made queen for a day, you would wave your magic wand and you would fix all of this. Right? And that belief is actually essential because without that, none of this makes any sense. Right? If I believed that these outcomes were our intentions, then I wouldn't be standing up here talking to you about how to use disparities data to create equitable change. Right? If I thought that these outcomes were our intentions, I would be standing here talking to you about morality, about ethics. But I'm not. I am here talking about how to use disparities data to create equitable change because I know that these outcomes are not what we intend. And yet, the data is what the data is. And if our intentions are good, but our outcomes are bad, then our intentions aren't enough. The impact of our work on our community is the truest measure of our intentions. And, and that is hard, right? And that leads us to the most important question of the day. How can the seemingly endless resources of this healthcare system combined with the good intentions of thousands of smart, dedicated, hardworking people result in the outcomes we see? 
How can all of this and all of us result in that? And the answer is systems. We are acting out our intentions amidst countless swirling systems, powerful systems that determine what is and is not possible in our work and in our lives. You know, there's only like one reality, right? We tend to think that our life is just kind of how life is, and that the things that we experience are just how people experience things. And yet we know, right, in some corner of our hearts that that's not quite true that there are forces out there, outside of ourselves, outside of our control, and outside of our merit, that determine what we experience. And it's hard to see those systems, it's hard to see those forces, so it's easy to discount their tremendous power in our lives. So let's take an example. A totally hypothetical example of a kid growing up gay in a small Midwestern town in the 90s. <laughs> I just made that up, hypothetical. <laughs> so, if you were a kid growing up gay in a small Midwestern town in the 90s, you wouldn't know anybody like you. You wouldn't see anybody like you in a position of power or authority. You would barely see anybody like you with a job. You would be fairly certain that there was no faith community for you, and you would never learn about folks like you in school. You wouldn't even know to read Audre Lorde or James Baldwin. You wouldn't learn about the history of people like Larry Kramer and the early days of HIV and the devastation that exists from failed public policy. You wouldn't know or know anyone like you that was okay. And all of those things, those messages about who's right and who's not, about who exists and who doesn't, about who is damned and who is saved, would exert a force on your life and you would learn real quick what to say, and what to wear, and how to act, to be okay. And that is the reality of life for queer kids in the United States. All of those things exert a force on the options queer kids have, and in a completely non-random way, they drive them towards outcomes in which they are more likely to use drugs and alcohol, more likely to be homeless, more likely to experience sexual assault, more likely to attempt suicide, more likely to commit suicide, and more likely to experience premature death. And there are powerful forces at work in the lives of black folks. Again, no other group in our nation's history has experienced such prolonged, deliberate, systematic, structural, and documented barriers to health and well-being as black and brown folks. And again, I am not a person of color, so those are not my stories to tell, but I'll mention a few of those for context now. Jim Crow, convict leasing, redlining, gerrymandering, the war on drugs, mass incarceration, and the list goes on. And all of those systems exert a force in the lives of black folks and drive them towards the outcomes that we see. We all live in systems. We work in systems, we play in systems, we die in systems. This is about systems. And this is a really important point, so I'm going to say this again. This is about systems. Disparities data is how we understand the systems. It is not how we understand individual people. I am that kid, spoiler, right, that grew up gay in a small Midwestern town in the 90s. And my life is reflected in those statistics. Those are my people. But you don't know anything about me or my life or my family or my options or my choices based on those data. Disparities data is not an indictment of queer kids or black folks or anybody else who might happen to fit into the categories that we highlight. Disparities data is an indictment of the systems that continue to produce disparate outcomes in our community. Because here's a fun fact about systems. Every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. So why does the data look like this in Jackson County? Because the systems in Jackson County are perfectly designed to do exactly this. And this system, our system, is just one small part of all of the systems at work in Jackson County. But we maintain this system, our system. This is the leadership team meeting. We lead this system. And how our system is currently built is perfectly designed to get the disparate outcomes we see. And how our system is currently designed might not be our fault, but it sure as hell is our responsibility. And that 
is a message of great hope. The disparities data shows us what the system is designed to do so that we can design it to do something different, something better. This is the leadership team meeting. I am standing in front of 100 leaders who have the power to fundamentally change the thing that our system is perfectly designed to do. OK, I can get preachy. So that was a lot. So let's <laughs> calm down for a minute. Let's calm down. So, those of you who know me know that I practice these presentations with my wife a lot, and she gave me an important piece of advice once. Real cool, babe, but you have to stop talking sometimes. And I carry that. It's an important piece of advice. So I'm going to pause for a minute, just give you guys a second. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to just reflect, just think of one word of where you are right now. Where's your head? Where's your heart? Just think for 10 seconds. All right, now I'm going to give you just a minute to shake it off and talk to the people around you about that word and where you're at. All right, go. Cool. Actively engaged. All right, how many people had a word that was like, what just happened? I thought we were going to be looking at slides with graphs. <laughs> Nobody? How many people had a like, yeah, let's bust some systems and do this? Yeah. And how many people had a like, just got to get out of here? Let's... <laughs> Lord, give me the courage. All right, all right. Great, so you're actively engaged. You've done everything I've asked, and that's fantastic. So now that we are oriented, to where we are and what we're talking about, let's look at some data. I'm going to be using, for the remainder of this presentation, birth outcomes data, but the stuff we're talking about can be applied to whatever you'd like to apply it to. So we're going to talk about infant mortality. Infant mortality is an important population level indicator. It is tracked in virtually every nation around the globe, and it is used to assess the success of a society in supporting its people. Infant mortality is given as a rate per 1,000 live births, and infant mortality occurs any time a baby dies before its first birthday. So the infant mortality rate in Michigan is 6.7. The infant mortality rate in Jackson County is a little worse. It's a little higher. It's 7.8. The infant mortality rate of white babies in Jackson County is 5.6. The infant mortality of black babies in Jackson County is 26.5. And so I wanted to put that number into context for us a little bit. So what I did is I went online and I looked up the infant mortality rates of every nation on the globe. And I put the infant mortality rate of black babies in Jackson County in that list. So here are a subset of the nations that have a lower infant mortality rate than that of black babies in Jackson County. Azerbaijan, Mongolia, Turkey, Jordan, Croatia, the United States as a whole, Japan, and Monaco. And I picked these nations because, you know, they kind of make a pretty graph, and I like pretty graphs, but the reality is that I had a choice. Of the 225 nations on the list, 158 of them had a lower infant mortality rate than the infant mortality rate of black babies in Jackson County. And so what that means in plain language is that if you were to go today and pick a baby at random born in Azerbaijan or Mongolia or Turkey or Croatia or any of those 158 nations, that baby born today would have a better chance at living to its first birthday than a baby, a black baby born today in Jackson County in our hospital. And that is devastating. So what are we going to do? Glad you asked. So there are a lot of things we could do. Let's, I'm going to focus on what are the things I think we should do, right? It's a much smaller list. So right now what we're going to do is we're going to walk through a tool called targeted universalism, which posits that we can achieve universal outcomes through targeted approaches. And it's a stepwise approach to get from these really big population outcomes to a specific place of action. So, 
The first step in targeted universalism is to set a universal goal. And now infant mortality is, is too big, it's huge. We can't really work on infant mortality. We have to work on what we call the drivers of infant mortality, the things that affect it. And so for this example, we're gonna be talking about access to adequate prenatal care, which is a criteria defined by a tool we call the Kessner Index that is tracked by the state of Michigan. So we're gonna say, for example, that we want to set a universal goal of increasing the percentage of women in Jackson County who receive adequate prenatal care. Now, the next step is pretty intuitive. We are going to measure what percentage of women currently receive adequate prenatal care. Turns out 71%. The next step is where targeted universalism gets really intentional about a focus on equity. Because the next step is to measure that number across different populations. Now we already saw that there's a disparity at the infant mortality level. We can anticipate that there just might be a disparity at this level also, and it turns out there is. Only 54% of black and brown women experience adequate prenatal care in Jackson County compared to 74% of white women, right? So the next step, now that we've identified a population that is ex experiencing barriers, is to understand those barriers. What are the specific barriers that black and brown women face in receiving adequate prenatal care? And spoiler alert, we'll get back to this in a minute, but extra credit if you ask them. Helps. And then, now that we've gone through this process, we are equipped to design targeted intentional strategies aimed specifically at those barriers. Ta-da. No? It might shock you to know that I have at times been accused of using lots of words to describe really common sense stuff. Hence the wisdom in Nicole's advice to me. But, I mean, like, this is not, you know, like, what did we do here? We just, like, did something really intuitive. And that's why I like targeted, targeted universalism, right? It's, it's a method that seems really intuitive, but yet it, it drives us towards powerful solutions. And the other thing that I really like about targeted universalism is that it demonstrates both the connectedness and the distinction between equality and equity. And that can be kind of confusing, so we're gonna talk about that. So equality is the instance of things being equal, right? Everybody has the same thing. So you can see in this image four different people, each one of which has a bike, the same bike, and that's equality. Everybody has an equal thing. Equity is a little more nuanced. <laughs> equity is about connecting needs with resources, about understanding different people's needs and connecting them with the things that are specific to those needs. So in the second image, we have the same four people, but this time they all have a bike that's tailored to their specific needs. And I mean, we want both of these things, right? We want everyone to be equally able to enjoy the pleasure of riding a bike. But if you go talk to that woman in the wheelchair in that first image and you tell her that she has equal access to bike riding because she's got the same bike as everyone else, there is something deeply unjust about that. And in fact, we know that to be the relationship between equity and equality. Equal outcomes require equitable action. And so when people see the disparities data and they go, oh my God, what do we do? This is what they want to know. This is what we do. This is where the equity work has to happen. What are the barriers that different types of folks experience and how do we remove them? Black and brown women are currently experiencing significant barriers to receiving adequate prenatal care in Jackson County. So let's figure out how to get rid of those barriers and, and support black and brown women. And Given the persistence of disparities data in our community over time, we are not very good at this. We are not good at identifying who needs more or different resources and just doing that. Which is strange, right, because that work clearly aligns with both our intention to provide excellent care to everyone and to our financial model. But regardless, we're just, we're not good at it and I don't, I don't quite know why. And maybe we're not good at it because we're using the wrong tools. Healthcare as an industry is reasonably obsessed with performance improvement, which as a field of study has a wide variety of diverse tools that we could be using. But we seem really stuck on Lean Six Sigma, which are tools that emerged from automotive and manufacturing. And although useful at times, 
Maybe creating a high quality, low cost car is a fundamentally different problem than making sure every baby lives to their first birthday. Or maybe we're not good at this because, like we said, talking about this stuff is hard. Talking about race is hard. Talking about sexuality and gender expression is hard. It's hard to talk to First Nation folks about all that they've lost. And it's hard to talk to somebody struggling with immigration status about the fear they live with every day. And for me, anyway, when everyone around me, my colleagues, my friends, my family, my neighbors, the people I see in the store all kind of look like me, it's really hard to make this work something about us instead of for them. Or maybe we're not good at this work because we still think this work, equity work, is something that we can do at work. That we can leave this on our desks and go home to our family and our friends and our communities unchanged and show up again tomorrow and pick it up and expect that things will somehow have just gotten better. Maybe this work requires more of us than to be fully committed to equity at our jobs. Maybe this work requires us to be fully aware of how our lives fit into the systems that are perfectly designed to produce the results we're trying to fix. But I don't know. You guys know you're doing the work, you're the ones on the ground. I don't know. We're not good at this. We should get good at this because this is what we need to do. And this is how we need to do that work. We need to ask the people experiencing the barriers. Nobody understands barriers better than the people that are experiencing them. We need to ask them what they need. And I am not talking about surveys or focus groups or the harvesting of sound bites to plug into our institutional solution algorithm. We need to invite people into our world and ask them, empower them to work with us, to guide us, to lead us in designing systems that work for them. And we are not doing this out of pity or guilt. We are doing this out of a compulsion to be excellent because we cannot be excellent any other way. We cannot create excellent services and systems and care if we do not involve the people who, who will be using those resources. Black babies in Jackson County are dying at nearly five times the rate of white babies, and it is not because black moms are not doing what healthcare said. Black babies are dying at nearly five times the rate of white babies in Jackson County because healthcare isn't doing what black moms need. And if we have the courage and the humility and the compassion to live in that reality, then we fundamentally change the opportunities of what our healthcare system can do and of what our community can be. And if we choose to live in that reality, we have access to tools, cool tools. People love human-centered design. It's got a cool name, it's got sweet branding, like it seems sweet, and it is, right? And people are really hopped up on human-centered design until they realize who the people are around which the design is centered. Because it ain't us. It isn't institutional perspective centered design. Right? It is intentionally and unapologetically centered around the people who are experiencing barriers to care. And like just about all the tools that we work with in the Jackson Collaborative Network, it is based in empathy, in knowing each other deeply. And that's why it shows up here. It's why we didn't start with it. What do we do? We don't start with this because unless we've taken this journey, unless we understand everything that we've talked about until now, we cannot understand why we need empathy at the center of what we do. And unlike, I would say, most of the tools that exist in the healthcare performance improvement arsenal, human-centered design is not a tool of institutional change. Human-centered design is a tool of relational change, a way for us to change our relationships, a method for us to meet and meet new and different people and know them deeply so that they become our people and to leverage the power of those relationships to change what our institution does and how it works. 
I've also sometimes been accused of being too abstract, working through all my issues here. So inevitably, there are people asking a very reasonable question, which is like, what do you mean, what does it look like? So I'm going to present an example. This is an example from the Jackson Community Foundation. Monica Moser is the president and CEO of the foundation. She is also a close friend and a ally in this work, and I'm sharing this example with her permission. So Monica and her program director, director Dana, wanted to evaluate their grant program from a perspective of equity. We call this using an equity lens. So they wanted to look at what they were doing and analyze its impact on equity. And when they did that, they realized that almost none of their resources, their money in their grant program, was going to black and brown-led organizations. And, this, and, and they didn't like that, right? Not only did it violate their sense of equity, but they knew that there are awesome things happening in our community, being done by black and brown-led organizations, and they wanted to be a part of it. They wanted to support it. So they decided to look, dig a little deeper. And when they did, they realized that black and brown-led organizations weren't receiving funding because they weren't even applying for funding. An important step. So what they did with that information is where we see the mindset shift of equity at work. Right? What they did with that information is hear it as themselves. They said, there is a barrier in our work that is preventing a very specific type of person from accessing our resources. And we didn't intend it. We don't want that to happen. But that doesn't matter because that's the impact that it's having on our community. And with that information and that framing, they went out and they talked to people. They called people, new people, that they didn't have a relationship with. And they sat down and they asked them, these people who were leading black and brown-led organizations, and they said, this is what's happening. Why? What, 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 what is the barrier? And how can we fix it? They did all of these different interviews. And then Monica and Dana came back together and they compared their notes and they, they processed what they heard and they drafted a set of changes. And then they went back out to the community, to those people that they had known, that they met, right? And they said, here's what we think we heard and here's what we think we could do. Does this work? Would this work? And in the course of that process, they did create deep, fascinating changes to their grant program. And I, they're included at the end of this slide deck, so you should check them out. But they made substantive changes to their own process. And they developed meaningful relationships with people who they didn't know before. And I've been focusing on what they did, but equally important is what they did not do. When they realized that black and brown-led organizations were not applying for their funds, they did not create a series of informational how-to pamphlets to explain how to access their funds. Page on their website, glossy three, trifold folder of FAQs. They did not take that information and assume that the barrier was some sort of knowledge or information gap on the part of the people in the community. They identified that there were barriers that they themselves had put in place, regardless of intent, and they worked directly with people to figure out how to remove them, and then they just did it. Simple, not easy, but simple. All right, guys, I think that's just about enough out of me for one day. <laughs> so let's bring it home. So now what? Now what? Well, now what is a deeply personal question, right? And I would not presume to know what any one of you should do with this content. But I will indulge just a bit to share with you both what I know and what I hope. So here's what I know. We started with the Jackson Collaborative Network, and we're going to come back to that now. Because you might not have been thinking about us, but we've been thinking about you. Everyone in the Jackson Collaborative Network is committed to going back to their organizations and talking about equity, refusing to not talk about equity. Committed to advocating for a new way of working together, advocating for a new way to hold ourselves collectively accountable for improved outcomes in Jackson for everyone, especially the people experiencing the greatest barriers. Everyone is committed to that work. And for me personally, 
As an employee of Henry Ford, Allegiance Health, I'm committed to doing what I can within my own organization to continue that work. And that's what I know. And so here's what I hope. I hope that this organization, our organization, my organization, the organization that I grew up in, the organization that held me and my family for over 30 years, the organization that I love, decides to be the first healthcare system in the nation to completely eradicate disparities. Because this is a choice. We have demystified the science of systems, and we know we can fix this. I know we can fix this. And I hope that individually and collectively, we find the courage and the humility and the compassion to make equity our legacy. May it be so. Thank you.